Today, we'll be going over the proof for the parallel axis theorem. The parallel axis theorem says that if we already know the moment of inertia about the center of mass for a particular object, then we can find the new moment of inertia if we spin that object around a different axis, provided that the new axis is parallel to the original one. In this formula, I sub z represents our moment of inertia about our new axis, I c m represents the moment of inertia about the center of mass, m represents the mass of the object, and d represents the distance between the new axis and the center of mass. We will start by drawing a generalized shape on a coordinate grid. In this shape, the center of mass is located on the origin, and the object may have any kind of moment of inertia. Our new axis will be located a distance d away from the original axis. Notice how the original axis of rotation goes into and out of the page, and the new one also goes into and out of the page. Therefore, these two axes are parallel to one another, and so this satisfies the criteria for the parallel axis theorem. We can start with the basic equation. ICM, the moment of inertia about the center of mass, is equal to the integral of the little bits of moment of inertia, which can be represented as r squared times dm. In this equation, r represents the distance between any point particle and the center of mass. r squared can be found by using the x-coordinate squared plus the y-coordinate squared by the Pythagorean theorem. Therefore, we can rewrite our integral as the integral of x squared plus y squared dm. Next, because our new axis of rotation is a distance d away from the original center of mass, we can say that the new moment of inertia is just a linear translation away from the original one. Because it is a horizontal translation along the x-axis, we only need worry about the x-coordinate translation. Our next step is to expand this into its full polynomial. Just by moving the terms around, we can collect the x-squared and the y-squared together, and then move everything out. Next, because the integral is a linear operator, we can then break the integral down as a sum of three smaller integrals. But before we move on, we need to understand how to find the center of mass of the original object. By definition, the center of mass, at least along the x-axis, is equal to 1 over the mass times the integral of x dm. And because we are centered about the origin, this has to equal 0. Since 1 over m is never equal to 0, the integral of x dm must equal to 0. So we can say the integral of x dm is equal to 0. Now we can proceed with the rest of the proof. By definition, we had already said that the integral of x squared plus y squared dm is equal to the original ICM. Next, we can pull out any constants that we see in these integrals. So in here, we can pull out the 2 and the d, and what's left is the integral of x dm. Here, same thing, we can pull out the d squared, so we get the integral of d squared times the integral of dm. As noted earlier, the integral of x dm is equal to 0. So because that term comes up here again, we can see that this term entirely cancels out to zero. Now in finishing up our proof, we can say that the moment of inertia about our new axis is equal to the moment of inertia of our original center of mass plus d squared times the integral of dm. Now the integral of dm is equal to the sum of the little tiny bits of mass, which should give us the total mass of this shape. Therefore, we can say that this integral evaluates to m times d squared. And this should be the proof for the parallel axis theorem. Now in our derivation, we had only considered what would happen if we put our parallel axis along the x-axis. What if we had decided to put it here? What would happen then? We could then change our coordinate grid so that this becomes our new x-axis. And therefore, the derivation would still follow the same. It's just that this becomes our new distance that we're interested in.